Uh, this afternoon, I'm just going to be talking about what's happening in, um, in, in the scene in Australasia. Um, I'm representing CORL, which is the group of Australian university libraries. I'm also talking um, with a few references about it in New Zealand libraries over the conference um, here today. Um, and that's my full-time job there. I work at University of New South Wales in Sydney, um, where I'm the head of the library there. And I've got a couple of other hats listed there, which are sort of all in the open space. But interestingly, in call, I'm also on the committee, which does all the consortium purchasing with all the publishers. And I've kind of done that in a strategic way, because I want to see both sides and how I can leverage them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good luck, right. <laughs> so here's, here's just a slide um, about uh, the university libraries in Australia call. Um, we're not a huge group. We don't have a huge number of universities in Australia because our population's not very high. But we also work with the New Zealand groups. Um, we, have a fo we also have a program on fair access to research led by one of the university librarians, Jill Ben. Um, there's also an interesting project which is helping students, you know, uh, with using all the digital environments, and I think that actually feeds into this to some degree. Um, we also work with the AOASG, which I'll explain in a moment. So the AOASG, this is the equivalent, I think, in Australia of Spark and Spark Europe. So it's a strategy group for open access. Um, and I'm giving it a plug here because I'm the chair of the AOASG as well. Um, we don't have all the universities as members, but um, it really is my mission to increase our membership, um, just to help give us uh, the resources that we need. Um, also, I'll just do a quick plug here for SCOS. You've heard a little bit about SCOS. Um, so this is a new group out of Spark Europe, working also with partners around the globe um, to identify uh, the infrastructure which is, you know, which is working for open science, but we take for granted, and it may not really all have sustainability for funding, so we're doing a crowdfunding system. But I want to mention that uh, we did a round of crowdfunding in Australia uh, earlier this year, and more than half the universities have pledged funding for three years, which is amazing. So if we can do it, it can happen in your countries as well. <laughs> so now um, I move on to the policy and practice environment, um, in, which we have in Australia. Uh, the research funders, the ARC and NHMRC, they both have a policy on open access which is good. Um, almost half the universities have a policy or statement on open access in Australia, which is really good. Um, now, the ARC um, also runs a research assessment exercise called Excellence in Research for Australia, and it's based on the REF in the UK, really, except that this is a full submission and not just a submission of your best research works, but all of them. And it's a really important point because I'll show you in the architecture how that work actually feeds our repositories. Um, also, the Universities Australia, which, which is at the peak group um, in Australia, also supports so the FAIR principles, which is really good. Um, this slide is about the national e-research infrastructure. There's been a, there has been a lot of infrastructure in e-research um, for quite a long time in Australia. And if you get these slides, I've put some links to a couple of the seminal works. And they're actually really interesting because they're about engaging researchers to use e-research infrastructure. And the repositories are kind of sitting on top of that infrastructure. Um, and I'll show you a little bit further on also about a couple of the synergies. Um, on the bottom is a paper about that the government now plans are to harmonise um, all the agencies working around e-research infrastructure in Australia. So for the next uh, tranche of, I think, of funds, we're going to see that researchers don't have to work with so many different agencies. They can just work with one. So I'm really looking forward to see how that's going to work. Um, Who's heard of ANDS? Anybody heard of ANDS? Yeah. 
So that's been around for quite a while now, and that's um, a well-known agency. Um, um, it looks after the data services that we have, and that's going to be affected in that structural change. So um, here is a basic architecture. I know some of you others have had really, really you know, nice and impressive architecture slides, but mine's pretty simple. Um, what I just wanted to show is that um, with different funding at different times, we've built different infrastructure for different purposes. So um, we've got the research management systems. Every university has one because we all do the research assessment exercise. <coughs> And that tends to feed information into the IRs, and every university's got one because we were funded to all build one. Um, then we've got Rnet, which is, which, is a, which is an underlying kind of network supporting researchers. And then we've had funding via ANS to build all of the repositories for data uh, services. And there's also a data storage layer. So I just want to show that, you know, that there's a separation there. And a lot of it is harvested then by the National Library or through Trove, which is great. And if you've ever looked at Trove, it's really, really wonderful. But it's actually combining the research outputs and the data in with all the library collections. So it's not actually that easy to find um, our research outputs. Um, so one of our issues in Australia that we're thinking about is that we don't really have a collection of research Australia and we don't have a portal for it like you have here in Europe and in the US. So we're having um, a think about that. Uh, our first repositories were a long time ago. They, they were funded by um, the ARC. Um, and they were to capture all the theses. And about that time, Australian universities started not accepting print theses copies, but only digital copies. So that's been going really well for um, a long time, but we've moved the software on. Um, now, uh, the IRs, uh, we had a lot of funding quite a long time ago to all build a repository for every institution. And then there was a consortium as well to build a solution that many institutions um, used. But that's quite a long time ago now, really, isn't it? So a lot of those infrastructure um, are probably aged and ready for refresh. <laughs> so like a lot of the other, you know, like a lot in a lot of other countries, there's a wide range of tools and solutions being used, um, but also, also the RMS systems, there's a wide range of systems being used. And interestingly, um, some institutions harvest via the repository and populate the RMS, but most would harvest all of the public dash. I think most of them would harvest all of, you know, like all of, all of the online resources um, and that they harvest the metadata into the RMS and then it's pushed into the repository <coughs> that way. But every institution has to have a collection of all their research <coughs> outputs for the Excellence in Research for Australia process. So there's, I guess there's a two-way flow for many institutions there. Um, we've got a pretty large collection with over a million items, um, a lot of usage. Uh, 680,000 full text items built over quite a lot of time. But, you know, I'd say that, um, if I can say, not every institution is at the same level, you know, with their repositories, because they don't all have an OA policy. Um, they all have to do ERA, but a lot of them are not pushing it all into the open space, even though they're pushing it to the research assessment exercise. Um, so the metadata repositories are not as old. Um, they were funded by ANS. We've got a central point, um, which is RDA, or Research Data Australia. Um, it harvests all the metadata. So I don't, I don't know what people think, but my personal uh, thinking is that we have this legacy of IRs and then data repositories. I, I don't think going forwards that that architecture, to me, is really researcher-centric. I don't, I don't think researchers and also people in the public understand why to go to one infrastructure for one output and the other infrastructure for our other. It's my belief in Australia that um, we're going to see a convergence over time, which I think is good. 
So most of the data repositories are actually only handling metadata and then they're linking to data stores and um, there's a wide variety of tools that people are using as well. So I think this is my last slide. Um, the reason why I'm here um, is that I, I'm working with a large number of people in the Australian scene to do a project where we're reviewing uh, the repository infrastructure. It's similar to some of the projects I've heard about this week in other countries. Um, so what we're doing is um, we're doing an assessment of the current status, uh, looking also at best practice around the world. We're developing also user stories, but looking at other user stories. And we want to improve what we have first, but then we want to create an ideal state and review tools and possibly do a consortium purchase or a consortium. But because it's Australia, it'll be opt-in. So, you know, I would say half the universities might be involved and, and half won't because they're happy with their repository or because they don't have any resources at the moment to move. Mm. So that's where we're at in Australia. Um, so there's a long history of repositories, but um, I think um, we've kind of seen a plateauing of engagement in Australia. And I think having... Uh, Having other newer tools will help to boost engagement and to also boost the content levels. And um, I'm really keen to try to help other universities to also develop policy on open access because I think that's a good enabler. Mm. Thanks.